This video is sponsored by World Anvil. Content warning. This video includes footage of and or discussion around racism, sexism, violence, child endangerment, child abduction, child labor, child slavery, child abuse, violence against children, human sacrifice, black magic, voodoo, brainwashing, mind control, bugs, bats, snakes, spiders, eyeballs, animal brains, Kate Capshaw screaming, Jesus Christ, this movie sucks. There's a new Indiana Jones movie coming out, and I sure hope it's good. Reviews aren't great so far, but you never know. But if it's not good, then that will break the pattern. Because historically, the odd-numbered Indiana Jones movies have been good, and the even-numbered ones have been bad. And yeah, everybody was rightfully pretty frustrated with the fourth film, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but I would argue that the second movie, Temple of Doom, is far, far worse. But this is not a movie review channel. This is a channel where we talk about RPGs like Dungeons & Dragons and give advice on how you can enhance your games. And honestly, Temple of Doom is one of those movies that would make a great D&D game, because you can easily cut all the things I hate about it by not making it an Indiana Jones movie. So what we're going to do today is unearth that nugget, dust it off, wash off all the racist crap, and present a story you can drop directly into your own campaign. You know, like an archaeologist. First, a disclaimer. I'm going to talk about this film as if you're adapting it directly, scene for scene, for your D&D game whenever possible. But honestly, that's just a format to discuss the various lessons we can pull from this movie and apply to our own games. This movie is incredibly famous. It's unlikely your players haven't seen it or heard of it. So if you just run this adventure in your game, they're likely going to know exactly what you're referencing, which could be fine. That kind of adventure is a lot of fun in its own way. Of course, this movie is also almost 40 years old, so maybe your players actually haven't seen it. Maybe none of you have seen any of the Indiana Jones movies. And if that's true, then you should follow me on Twitch. Every day next week, we're going to watch an Indiana Jones film in a watch-along format to get ready for the release of The Dial of Destiny, which means I'm going to have to sit through this garbage movie yet again. But it's going to be a great time. You'll get to hear all the trivia and opinions I had to cut out of this video. Because, believe it or not, this script was almost even longer. Stay tuned to the end of the video to see next week's Twitch schedule for these watch-alongs. Now let's get into the adventure. Chapter 1. The Cold Open. Content warnings. Racial caricatures. Death by flaming impalement. This movie opens in Shanghai in 1935, with a nearly three minute long scene where Kate Capshaw sings Anything Goes in Mandarin. Patrick Willems made a terrific video about the art of opening credit sequences, particularly when they can prepare the audience for the tone of the film. This does not do that. After that, we get a scene where Indiana Jones meets with a Chinese crime lord to trade a relic for a diamond, and then he gets poisoned and kills a guy with a flaming kebab, and everybody winds up chasing the diamond and the antidote around the dance floor as panicked patrons flee the bar. This is actually a terrific way to open your own campaign. See, the classic D&D trope is to start your game in a tavern, but another way to start the story is at the tail end of another adventure. And this is something the Indiana Jones movies love to do. And the way they do this is actually really interesting. See, this isn't quite a James Bond cold open. That's certainly the inspiration, but in the Bond films, historically, the opening scene has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. That's not quite true for Indiana Jones films. In these cold opens, we usually see something that will have some sort of impact on the rest of the adventure, either establishing a detail we'll want to remember, or introducing some key characters. But he's still usually on the tail end of a totally unrelated mission. I played in a campaign once where our DM started the game with our party just reaching the magic item we'd been sent to obtain, and then having to escape from the dungeon, just like in Raiders of the Lost Ark. A cold open is also a really fun way for players to get used to their characters by starting them with a combat. That gives them the chance to get their feet wet and learn how to play the game without putting pressure on them to also start writing down every name they hear. Strangely, starting with a combat might be a lot less intimidating than just dropping the party into a tavern and expecting them to roleplay. Although, technically this adventure does also still start in a tavern. Another great lesson we can learn from this fight is that Honestly, it isn't a fight. The goal isn't kill everyone. That doesn't give our hero what he wants or needs. Instead, our heroes have a couple of really clear motivations. Get the antidote and get the diamond, respectively. The rest of the scene is just dice rolls to see if they're able to get the objects they're looking for. When they fail a roll, a bystander accidentally kicks the item away and it slides further across the dance floor. It's also fun that one character finds the item that the other character wants, which Coincidentally, is a fun way to make sure the player characters have a reason to work together. But I really wouldn't recommend you count on this. You can't rely on a random series of events linking your heroes together. 
Otherwise, you get somebody like Willie Scott, who really has no reason to go on the upcoming adventure. It's one thing to thrust them together through circumstance, but really, the only reason Willie even leaves the bar with Indy is because she has the antidote. That's the reason she's in the rest of the movie, and that's probably just too unpredictable for D&D. You can't really plan on that. You can't control who will find which item when it's probably all going to be determined by random rolls of the dice. Anyway, they bust out the window and land in a car driven by Indiana Jones's sidekick, Short Round. I wonder what that actor's up to these days. Mom, I just want an Oscar! They race to the airfield, where Dan Aykroyd boards them on a plane, and they barely get away from the Chinese gangsters. Hey, did I mention that the lead gangster's name is Lao Shea? That is such a frustratingly good joke. And it's also a fantastic example of out of the frying pan into the fire storytelling. Sure, you got away, but you know, you're still in trouble, you just don't realize it. This kind of twist and reversal is terrific, and it's especially important to learn how to do this if you're not playing a game like D&D with the binary pass-fail mechanic of the D20, but instead something with degrees of success, like a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Once Indiana Jones and his pals are asleep, the pilots dump the fuel, you know that thing airplanes can do where you dump all the fuel mid-flight, and then they parachute out of the plane. Our heroes have to escape by inflating the emergency raft and leaping out onto a mountain, and then they ride the raft down the mountain until they fly off of a cliff and land in a river, safe and sound. If you're thinking this movie is awfully silly so far, yeah, it is, and honestly, that's fine. And you're gonna wish it had actually stayed silly, because it's gonna zag on us. Chapter 2, The Plot Hook. Content Warning, Child Abduction. The party washes up on a riverbank, and they figure out they're in India when they're met by a very severe-looking old man. He guides them to a village, and immediately the villagers start begging them for help. We don't get any subtitles for this scene, but some emotions are universal. And obviously there's a white savior narrative at play here, so in your games, just don't make everybody in this village a person of color, and you won't run into that issue. But besides that little detail, the sequence where they arrive in the village is terrific. I've talked before about how a lot of players, especially new players, want their characters to be perceived as heroes. That's part of their fantasy. But if they just walk into town and everybody is already desperate for help, so desperate that they all start chanting and crying and lamenting and pawing at them, not to hurt them or pick their pockets, but just to make sure they're real, well, that's going to be deeply unnerving. This isn't one quest giver saying, thank God you're here. This is an entire community viewing your arrival as the answer to their prayers. You are literally their last hope. That's really impactful, and this film demonstrates how honestly frightening that would be. If this is the reaction of the people seeing a stranger, what the hell has happened here? Another great detail is this old woman who grabs Short Round and starts crying and trying to get him to safety. That's a great bit of foreshadowing. The villagers agree to guide the party to Delhi, but first they want to take them to Pankot. They say that evil people have taken over Pankot Palace, which Indiana Jones thought had been deserted for 70 years. But the old man says the palace again has the power of the dark light. Men came from the palace and took the village's sacred stone, which protects the village. We get a description of the stone, which is honestly another great technique for a MacGuffin hunt. If you're sending your party after a magic item, give them a description of it so they know what they're looking for. And then we get a bit of exposition around why this stone is so important. As soon as the stone was taken from the village, the wells and rivers dried up. The crops and the animals died. And then there was a fire in the fields, but it was just a distraction, so men from the temple could enter the village and take away the children. Setting aside the, again, white savior narrative and the mysticism, objectively speaking, this is a nearly perfect plot hook. There's only one thing it needs, a ticking clock. Some sign that the children are still alive, but also a way to clearly establish that they are in active danger. And really, this is only the best plot hook for players who want to help people out of the goodness of their hearts. Some players might need more convincing than that. Which is why, that night, an emaciated boy staggers back into the village and collapses into Dr. Jones's arms, and repeats the word Sankara, as he hands Indy a scrap of a tapestry or something, before his mother appears and whisks the boy away. We learn that the boy escaped from the palace, but that there are many other children who are still there. And Dr. Jones rolls a history check and figures out why this stone was taken. I think that somebody believes the good luck rock from this village is one of the lost Shankara stones. What is Shankara? Fortune and glory, kid. We will learn later that this art depicts Shiva handing a priest five sacred magical stones to help the priest go forth and combat evil. I've spoken about this before, but a lot of D&D adventures offer multiple plot hooks, each designed to entice a different type of player. Here we have three plot hooks, which line up with the same types of plot hooks we often get in published adventures. First, the practical plot hook. 
The party doesn't know how to get home, and the locals will guide them, but first the locals need a favor from the party. On the way to Delhi, you will stop at Bangkok. Bangkok is not on the way to Delhi. The second is the humanitarian hook. The people of this town have been through a horrible ordeal, and someone needs to help them. Children. He says they stole their children. The third is the mercenary hook. Because some players are only interested in gold and rewards and are motivated purely by greed. So how do you hook them into a story? Fortune and glory. Chapter 3. The Role-Playing Encounter. Content warnings. Snakes, blood, and severed body parts. The next day, the party heads to Pancot Palace riding on elephants. Willie has a meltdown, so they camp for the night. As they talk, the elephant pokes and prods Willie with its trunk, which I only bring up because it leads to this genuinely great gag. I said, cut it out! <laughs> I hate that elephant. On the road the next day, they find some statues that are ornamented with fresh blood and human body parts. The guides get spooked and run off, so the party walks the rest of the way to the palace. This is actually really clever, not just because we're about to have a bunch more NPCs and having the guides there too will be too many to keep track of, but also because some stories aren't going to line up, and it's good to remove the villagers so the heroes don't have a chance to ask more questions about what the villagers believe and compare them to what we're about to hear from the people in the palace. So our heroes arrive at the palace and a clean cut man in a suit comes to greet them. He knows all about Dr. Jones thanks to his own time at Oxford. This is Chadar Lai, the palace's prime minister. He's very friendly and, well, obviously the film is using coding to imply that he's more civilized than the people from the village, which is not awesome. But of course, if you strip away the cultural context and drop this into your D&D game, then objectively, this is a great reversal of expectations. The palace is not at all how it was described by the locals. They're flattering the heroes and treating them well. Willie has dollar signs in her eyes and wants to marry the Maharaja for his money because she sucks. Of course, your players will probably not be so easily influenced by these trappings. They might see these folks as even more shady as before. But even if that's the case, it's still a fun reversal that can put the heroes on their back foot. It also makes the heroes feel like heroes yet again. The palace staff isn't dismissive of these heroes as just a bunch of meddling teens. At least in Dr. Jones's case, they're giving him a lot of respect. And whenever you do that, it actually does help knock down your party's walls. And they just might start to let their guard down. Because players like to feel like heroes. And like they're being recognized for their great deeds. So then our heroes are treated to a feast at the palace. There's another guest in town, British Captain Blumbert, stopping by on a routine inspection. There's clearly some resentment there from Chad Lai about being part of the British Empire. But you know, if you want an action movie that actually offers an interesting perspective on the British occupation of India, don't watch an Indiana Jones movie for that. Watch RRR instead. We meet the Maharaja, who is actually a child. Yet another twist. Sure, your players might be suspicious of these folks. Just because they're well-mannered doesn't mean that they're not abducting kids. But you know, can this kid be responsible for that? Something is clearly weird here. This is not adding up. And then the feast begins and, okay, you know what? The exposition is intercut with the food gags, but we're gonna focus on all the exposition first because I need you to focus on that before we get to all the other stuff. We learned that this palace was involved in a mutiny against the British nearly 70 years earlier, but even long before that, it was once the home of the Thuggy Cult, which apparently performed human sacrifices to Kali, but they were wiped out by the British more than a century ago. Now, f fun fact, the Thuggy weren't invented for the film, there's historical records about them. Although, whether they were real or an invention of British propaganda is a subject of some scholarly debates. But setting aside the fact that their depiction in the film is, shall we say, the subject of a great deal of artistic license, Kali especially is an important figure in Hinduism, and she certainly isn't the Indian version of the devil, which is how the movie treats her. But again, take this out of India and drop it into Faerun or Wildmount, and this scene totally works. Because Indiana Jones also asks about the Sacred Stone in a very careful way, because he doesn't trust the Prime Minister. That's probably the same reaction your players will have. Just because doubt has been removed from the child leader doesn't mean we won't expect his second-in-command to be secretly evil. And you know I love it when villains sit down with the hero for a nice dinner and talk very carefully, and so I love the way Chad Arlai counters Indiana Jones's not-so-subtle questions. The villagers rock, and the old legend of the Shankara stone. They're all vulnerable to vicious rumors. I seem to remember that in Honduras, you were accused of being a grave robber rather than an archaeologist. Look, sorry if it's a spoiler to call this guy a villain, but his name is Lai. This movie is produced by the same guy who gave us a loner named Han Solo and a bounty hunter named Greedo. You should know what's up by now. But the Maharaja interrupts and basically says, 
hey, I once thought these thuggy stories were just myths to frighten kids, but then I learned they were real, and I was ashamed to learn these things had happened. They will never again happen in my country. Fun fact, when you learn about misdeeds in your own hobby or industry or country, you can just say this, it's kind of the perfect answer. I didn't know it was real or didn't realize it was a big deal, but then I learned more about it, and now I'll help make sure it doesn't happen again. That's all anyone is ever asking. But, more relevant to our purposes of adapting this movie to D&D, Indiana Jones sincerely apologizes to the Maharaja, because sure he mistrusts Prime Minister Lai, but the Maharaja is clearly innocent and well-meaning, and he's a ruler, and he's being a pretty gracious host, and Indy has seriously crossed the line. And actions like this will also help the party like the young ruler. He is young, and I'd argue we immediately feel sympathy for young kings or emperors because we suspect they're in over their head, but then we see that he's wise, and he's also no-nonsense. These are two terrific traits to give an NPC to make the player like them. Interlude. Holy god, this movie is racist. Content warnings. Gross out food, snakes, beetles, eyeballs, animal cruelty, animal death, and brains. And racism, obviously. I know, Oreo, I don't like that it's racist either. Okay, let's talk about the horrible foods served in this feast. Honestly, maybe just skip this chapter if you have a sensitive stomach. First dish, snake surprise. A big snake full of smaller living snakes, which are eaten live and whole. Next dish, beetles. Side dish, Willie asks for something simple, like soup, and the soup they bring turns out to be full of eyes. And for dessert, chilled monkey brains served out of the monkey's severed head. And no, if you're curious, people in India don't eat eyeballs. Nobody eats living snakes, and definitely nobody eats brains out of actively rotting monkey skulls. Those last two foods are actively deadly to eat. This scene is grotesquely racist, because the joke is literally, hey, these people are from a different culture. I bet they eat the nastiest, grossest stuff we can come up with. I, I said, what about a meal of the worst stuff you would never imagine eating as long as you would live? I mean, we did have a lot of fun discussing it, because it was... Oh, let's sit around just thinking the most horrible things you can think of. It's also the exact same joke as the food from Galaxy Quest, except in that movie, the people serving the food are literal aliens who don't understand human culture, and are not residents of an actual country you can go visit! You can go to India and find out what they eat! The people who wrote this film ostensibly got the gig because they knew a lot about India, and this is what we got? George knew about our interest in India. We had traveled in India and we were uh, collecting Indian art and so forth the worst stuff you would never imagine eating. It also kind of works against the point of the scene. In theory, you could argue that this is a sign that the people who live at the palace are bad guys who secretly do blood rituals and human sacrifices. Spoilers. And the fact that they eat these gross foods so casually is a way to show the cracks slipping in their disguise. They can't even pretend to be normal. That's how far gone they are. Or instead, it might indicate that they just don't care if they get caught. Kind of like Hannibal Lecter hosting a dinner party and describing the food with a bunch of double entendres. And if this was your D&D game, you could do that. Make sure your players are comfortable with gross-out food descriptions before you deploy these sorts of descriptions, but that could totally work. But again, that's not how the scene plays. We still assume that the Maharaja is innocent, but this food is being served at his table. Indiana Jones, the expert in other cultures, makes no comment on all this gross food. He doesn't even react to the snakes, which, given his fear of snakes, is kind of a huge oversight. So this movie is trying to imply that this is considered normal for... I guess, the high society of India. And honestly, that idea is even more gross than the food itself. But this is actually a pretty easy fix in your game. You could basically imply that everything they learned about the evil palace was a red herring. Perhaps the villagers told you that the prince eats human brains, but then you get to the palace and you learn that chilled monkey brains are a delicacy here. Sure, it's gross, but it's just their way of life. We're so sorry for the misunderstanding, but there's nothing nefarious going on here. You should still be very careful of racial coding, but if this were a dragonborn palace or a lizard folk community, you could have them eat whatever the heck you want. Go nuts. Because those aren't generally inspired by real-world cultures. So the idea that they'd eat things that humans wouldn't is a lot more palatable. No pun intended. Of course, creating an entire culture to replace the racist caricature from the movie could be a lot of work, but it's worth it. After all, it's not just that this movie is insensitive, it's also way too over the top. As we saw from those meals, this community is pretty unbelievable. You could honestly do a lot to make it feel more authentic, which could perhaps fool the players into thinking that this palace is not the source of evil. Of course, you'd need the bad guys to get their lies straight, you need to figure out the timeline and keep track of who in the palace is a member of the cult and who isn't, and it would be really nice if you could have articles separating each of these, which of course, you can do all of that if you sign up for today's sponsor, World Anvil. World Anvil is an online toolkit that does all the things I said. Articles for each character? Sure. 
A timeline of when the palace was evacuated and when the people returned to it and when the cult began? Absolutely. They even have dice ruling tools that you can use to play the game right off of the website. And they support a number of great game systems, so you can run this adventure in 5th edition, Pathfinder, the Conan RPG, whatever you want. And World Anvil is offering a discount to viewers of this channel. If you visit worldanvil.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek at checkout, you can save 40% off of any annual membership. Once again, that's worldanvil.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek. Thank you so much to World Anvil for sponsoring this video. Chapter 4 Traps and Hazards. Content Warnings. Death by Hanging, Spiders, and Bugs. So many bugs. Indiana Jones visits Willie's room and gives her some fruit, and then we get a truly terrible flirting scene that makes no sense at this point in the film. I have nothing to add, the scene is bad, moving on. But then Indiana Jones gets attacked in his bedroom by a man with a garrote. Short Round gives Indy his whip, which is then used to hang the thug from the ceiling fan. Grim. But this makes sense, right? If the king's advisor is a cultist, then maybe any time he gets wind about the characters asking about the cult, one of those party members will be attacked by assassins during the night. Indy goes to Willie's room and finds a secret passageway leading into a dark tunnel. Indy and Short Round pass through a chamber full of bugs, and then they get locked in a room with a descending ceiling and spikes coming out of the ceiling and floor. Willie Scott has to go back through that bug room and put her hand into a slimy hole full of bugs to open the door. I hate this sequence so much, it's so gross, but it does have one of Harrison Ford's most unhinged line readings. We are going to die! Willie opens the trap and joins them in the room, but then Willie's butt bumps the trap and the room starts closing again, but they get away at the last minute and Indy grabs his hat. It's iconic. And okay, let's assume you want to put this trap in your game. You totally can. Indiana Jones movies do D&D traps better than any other franchise, we should talk about that some other time. Now before just dropping this into your game as is, you might want to, you know, check and see how people feel about bugs before you do this kind of thing. But also, I think you should make it more of a challenge for the people on the outside. Maybe instead of the room being full of small little bugs, the players outside could get attacked by some kind of monster. We could keep the bug theme if you want, and make the attackers a couple of fire beetles or giant spiders, that would probably be fine. But the core idea totally works. You divide the party, one set of players are in trouble thanks to a trap, but the others who can help are tied up with some sort of encounter. You'd want to find a way to make it clear how the trap can actually be solved from the outside. I'm not sure how you'd do that. If you have any ideas, leave them in the comments below. But the main point is, let's give our people outside the trap a more practical challenge, rather than just grossing them out with a bunch of bugs. As with everything in this thought experiment, replacing Willie Scott with literally any other character vastly improves things. If you think I'm exaggerating, you should know that the Clone Wars cartoon ripped off Temple of Doom for a two-part episode arc and replaced her with Jar Jar Binks, and it was a huge step up. Chapter 5. The Evil Ritual. Content Warnings. Body Horror, Human Sacrifice, Black Magic. The party makes their way through a spooky cave and finds themselves looking down into a truly spectacular piece of set design. This is the Evil Ritual Chamber. Again, they name drop Kali a lot, so... Don't do that for your games, but this could instead be a ceremony to Tiamat, or Orcus, or Vecna. Honestly, D&D has a bunch of great evil gods you could use instead. Have a guess. And then we get the ritual scene. The Maharaja kneels in front of a priest who honestly looks a lot like how Kalor the Vile looked in the 4th edition adventure Keep on the Shadowfell. So it looks like somebody else also found some D&D influence in this scene. This is Mola Ram, and he chants to Kali and plunges his hand into some dude's chest and rips out his still-beating heart, without even leaving a scar. Then they lower the still-living victim into lava, and the heart bursts into flames in Mola Ram's hand. Listen, again, setting aside the fact that this is meant to represent an actual real-world culture, and there's a lot of thoughtless stereotyping in this film, I won't deny that it's a hell of a villain introduction. He's only been in one scene, and you immediately know pretty much his whole deal. Oh, and then we see that the cult has three of the sacred stones our heroes are looking for. The stones glow with magic, but honestly that's a bit less shocking than, you know, the magic we just saw. But it does seem to confirm that these are the Sankara Stones. Also, the legend apparently says that when the stones are brought together, the diamonds inside them will glow, which gets Willy excited about sticking around. Honestly, at first I thought this was so unnecessary, you don't need to give people an incentive to be heroes after they just saw that ritual. But then I realized, yeah, actually you do. Players are deeply risk-averse, they don't like to lose characters. So if they're only motivated by greed, and then they see what just happened, they're gonna leave. Unless you tell them something like, there are diamonds inside these stones. It's not the best fit for our purposes, really, because your players won't be able to bust open the stones and take the diamonds without letting a village suffer and die. Well, they can smash open the other two stones, I guess. 
but you could still get the same effect through other ways. Maybe just put a bunch of gold somewhere nearby, or give one of the priests a badass magic item for the players to covet, and they'll stick around to get their hands on some loot. Actually, we're also about to find out that there are some gem mines beneath the temple, so that could be a great way to incentivize your players to be heroes. Chapter 6, The Villainous Plot. Content warnings. Child abuse, child labor, child slavery, blood, brainwashing, mind control, voodoo, and one of the bad guys in this scene is a white guy in brown face. Once the ceremony is complete and the worshippers clear out, Indiana Jones makes his way to the idol to take the sacred stones. But then he hears screams from further into the temple. He investigates and discovers all of the stolen children who are enslaved and forced to work in a mine. So the miners... are miners. That's another Galaxy Quest reference. Is Galaxy Quest secretly a Temple of Doom remake? No. And then Indiana Jones, Short Round, and Willy are all captured by the cultists. You don't have to do this in your games, don't force the players to get captured, but if they do happen to fail their stealth checks, you can maybe use this as a framework for what happens next. The party is locked in a cage with some children who aren't yet working the chain gang, and we learn why. The children are being made to drink blood and fall into the black sleep. Awake, but a living nightmare. It's brainwashing, basically. Jones is taken to meet Mola Ram, who says that the last two sacred stones were also hidden in the catacombs when the British first came. Four of the stones were hidden. They found two so far. So these children are mining for gems, but they're also looking for the last two stones. We also learn about Mola Ram's plan. He wants the cult to rule the world. Specifically, he seems keenly interested in tearing down all of the other religions. This is a great escalation of the stakes of your story, not just because of Molaram's plan for the rest of civilization, but also because there are two more stones left to be found, and you can imply that their power will grow exponentially with each stone they recover. And then Indiana Jones is force-fed blood, but he doesn't drink it. So the Maharaja tortures him with voodoo. Short Round puts a stop to that, so the priests whip Short Round and Dr. Jones, and then Jones is force-fed blood again. This time, they just hold his nose closed. Kind of weird they didn't try that the first time before whipping him and torturing him with voodoo. That might be a plot hole, unless you think that maybe these characters are just happy to find any excuse they can to hurt people. Not really a plot hole then. So Jones convulses for a while, and then he relaxes and starts chuckling. And look, let's briefly talk about mind control in D&D. First of all, you should not force this plot beat to happen. But if you're telling a story about mind control, this is kind of an excellent get-out-of-jail-free card to avoid a TPK. The bad guys don't want to kill the heroes because they can make use of everyone they find. Well, except for Willy, but we'll get to that in a minute. So you can have a party member get mind-controlled in your game. Or, you know, have the bad guys try to control them and have the player make a saving throw against it. And if that player succeeds, who knows? Maybe the character will just play along to see what happens. Not necessarily, but you never know. But of course, mind control is a big issue for some people. Any story beat that implies a loss of agency can really rub some players the wrong way, either because it goes against the fun they find in the game and they just find it frustrating, or because it's actively upsetting or triggering. Additionally, there are different forms of mind control in D&D, and they can be frustrating to different degrees for different players based on whether or not they get to do cool things on their turns, or if they have absolutely no part to play in the game for as long as they're mind controlled. I've talked about that before, and honestly, I might just make a whole other video about the different kinds of mind control in D&D, but this is actually something that I bring up in my Session Zero conversations now, whenever I'm starting a new campaign. Because I need to know upfront whether some players really don't like being mind controlled, so I know not to target them with those kinds of spells. Some players love to play along when their character is successfully mind controlled, and others really don't. And that's okay, because this is a game. Make sure you know what your players like and don't like before you push these things on them. Especially with something as delicate as taking away the ability to choose what they want to do in a role-playing game where deciding what you want to do is the entire point of the game. Chapter 7. Silencing the Intruders. Content warnings. Brainwashing, child labor, child abuse, and human sacrifice. They hold another ritual, and Jones is actually a participant this time, chanting along with the cult. Sure, he's in some sort of trance, but he's not a mindless zombie. He's been made into a believer. He's, like, into it. They bring Willie out, and this time she's going to be the victim of the ritual sacrifice, mostly just to shut her up so she can't tell anybody about what she's seen here. Now's also a good time to note that all the music for the rituals completely slaps. I probably can't do it justice here, this video has already been the target for copyright strikes more than 30 times, but John Williams delivers some excellent horror music, and a lot of the tracks don't have any of the normal Indiana Jones leitmotifs, so you can drop them into your game and most people probably won't be distracted by recognizable music. You know, unless your players are the sorts of sickos who would willingly watch this movie more than once for fun. 
then you should maybe expect someone to start chanting Kalima in the middle of your game. Meanwhile, Short Round has not been brainwashed, and he's working the chain gang, but he breaks his chains and escapes. As Willie is lowered into the lava, Short Round runs up and tries to snap Indiana Jones out of the mind control. So Indiana Jones slaps his child sidekick in the face. I'm not showing it. Short Round returns the favor by burning him with a torch, which is enough to snap Indiana Jones out of the mind control. And then they start fighting the cultists. And you know, since this fight is right next to a big rift into lava, this is a terrific place for an encounter. You don't have to kill every cultist with weapons or magic. If you can just push them towards the lava, that will be enough. Also, here's a nice little detail for your players with a high passive perception. As you'll recall, the Maharaja is kneeling in the front row of worshippers for these rituals. But as the fight breaks out, the Maharaja is whisked away. But he's not carried the way some bodyguards would perhaps carry their ruler. He's grabbed by the arms and dragged off. There's a hint there that perhaps he's been brainwashed, which players may have already guessed given all the brainwashing we've seen. You can probably make it even more explicit. Maybe through the player's eavesdropping or interrogating a guard or in the process of getting captured, they can actually learn that the young ruler allows the cult to act freely because they have him under their mind control. But that's an interesting wrinkle to this adventure as well, and one that would be fascinating to watch your players wrestle with. How many of these cultists are brainwashed and how many are true believers? Clearly, Mola Ram is bad news, but all these people chanting on the other side of the lava pit are probably innocent people who were just made to be participants. Honestly, that's probably why the filmmakers put those worshippers on the other side of the rift to make sure none of the innocent people would be killed by the heroes. But D&D games don't play out in the same linear way that movies do, so you don't know how players will unpack this issue of who is brainwashed and who isn't. And that might be frustrating for the party not to feel like they have all the answers. A lot of players really don't like to make hard choices, so big moral questions tend to make them uncomfortable, and they'll try to find an easy answer, like casting Detect Magic to look for a charm effect. Which, honestly, actually, that would probably work. And that's fine, you can reward those sorts of attempts if you think they make sense. But also, if you're just trying to run a more straightforward adventure game, some simple coding can help a lot. Maybe it's as simple as, the brainwashed people don't carry weapons, just in case they ever break free of the mind control. That would be a pretty easy way to make things simpler for the players, which might be just what they're looking for from the game. They might just want to fight monsters recreationally and are not excited to struggle to figure out who is in on a conspiracy. Indiana Jones goes to kill Molaram, but he slips into a trap door and vanishes. <laughs> I honestly love that laugh. Mola Ram is a great villain, and a lot of that just comes from the performance. Prime Minister Lai attacks Indiana Jones with a knife, and Jones returns the favor by breaking all of Lai's chest bones. Chapter 8. Rescuing the NPCs. Content warnings. Voodoo, violence against children, and brownface. They pull Willie to safety, and then Jones grabs the stones and suits up. Then he goes down into the mines and starts beating up guards. The kids are immediately excited to be free, so I'm not really sure what happened with all the brainwashing. Maybe I misunderstood what they were saying earlier, but you know what? It doesn't matter. You can explain this by linking any brainwashing that children might be under to those stones. Once the stones have been removed from the idol, maybe that ends the brainwashing effect on the kids. It really doesn't matter. Honestly, the point is that having a bunch of hypnotized children in the scene would be a huge bummer, so do whatever you can to find your own rationale for why they are not brainwashed at this point in the story. The children rush up through the mines and out into the palace. Meanwhile, Indiana Jones fights the biggest, meanest cultist. Then the Maharaja appears on a ledge and starts torturing Indy with voodoo. So clearly not all the brainwashing ended. The fight leads onto a rock-crushing conveyor belt. That's a really fun place for a combat. Also, fun fact, Harrison Ford couldn't film this scene because he threw out his back, and I wrote this script while being pressed against a heating pad since I also threw out my back. See, Mom? I finally got my wish. I got to be Indiana Jones. Anyway, Short Round fights the Maharaja and breaks the voodoo curse, and the thug gets crushed in the rock compressor. The Maharaja is about to murder Short Round with a dagger, but Short Round burns the Maharaja with a torch and breaks him out of the black sleep. Honestly, the fact that Short Round has figured out that the brainwashing can be disrupted and broken by burning people with a torch, so he just keeps doing that to different people, that's the most D&D thing in this movie. That's actually exactly what your players are going to do. Chapter 9, A Chase Sequence. Content Warnings. None? Holy shit, that's awesome. The Maharaja tells them to take the left mining tunnel to get out, and so as more cultists flood the room, the heroes retreat. This is the least D&D thing ever. Players don't retreat. But of course, our heroes wind up taking the right tunnel. By that I mean the wrong tunnel, which is the right tunnel. By that I mean left, not right. Which is wrong. Right. And then the bad guys also take a minecart and chase them. And look, first of all, if you have a minecart in your game, your players are going to want to do a minecart chase, so you should just be ready for that. But I don't really think that you can directly translate a minecart chase into your game that easily. Players have spells and powers that they can use to change the conditions of the test. And that's okay. Instead of having a map and tracking movement, run this chase as a skill challenge and just invite your players to do cool stuff. It should work pretty well. 
Anyway, after the minecart chase, they have to escape from a flood of water that Mola Ram sent after them, and then Indiana Jones has to fight two swordsmen with his whip, which is a reference to the sword fight from the first film that Harrison Ford couldn't do because he had diarrhea. Huh, I guess I'm like Indiana Jones in that way, too. I can't do sword fights at all, and I get diarrhea every time I eat dairy or eggs. I'm an action hero, movie dad! Are you proud of me? Chapter 10. The Final Fight. Content warnings. Heights, crocodiles, and... I guess cultural appropriation would be the best fit. Indiana Jones winds up in the middle of a rope bridge, with cultists closing in from either side. Molaram is on one side of the bridge, holding Willy and Short Round hostage. Jones threatens to drop the stones over the side, but Molaram just laughs it off. You can always find the stones again later. So Indiana Jones goes to cut the bridge, but Molaram brings Willy and Short Round onto the bridge, probably make sure he doesn't do exactly that. But this is a D&D adventure. So of course, when the players get an idea in their head, they stick with it. As the Game Master, when your players do something like this, you pretty much have to improvise and figure out how to handle it on the fly. Well first, everybody on the bridge should make some sort of check to hold on as the bridge breaks. We'll call this a dexterity or maybe just an acrobatics check, and a lot of them fail. Then the heroes and some of the cultists ride each half of the broken bridge down as they fall. Then when the remains of the bridge hit the cliffs, there should be another roll to see if anybody flies off. This would probably be an athletics check to hold onto the boards. I wouldn't recommend you make this more than two rolls because Failing a roll pretty much means instant death, and that's really rough to subject a player character to. I'd also say that you could give the heroes advantage on both of these rolls, because Jones warned his friends in advance, in Chinese, about what he was going to do. And we know from the opening scene that both of his friends speak Chinese. And now you have a totally different fight. A vertical fight on a ladder. And of course, the bridge itself is fragile, so anybody who moves around on it has to roll again, or risk falling. And again, as I said, if they fall and no one can catch them, that's pretty much instant death. It has to be. That's the best way to reward the players when they knock bad guys off the bridge, but it also heightens the stakes for this fight. So let's fill the water with crocodiles ready to tear everybody apart. That gamifies the instant death that we've talked about. Oh, and the bad guys from the opposite side of the bridge who didn't fall or just weren't on the bridge yet start firing arrows at our heroes. This fight kicks ass. Indiana Jones and Mola Ram fight on the bridge ladder, and Mola Ram tries to rip out Indy's heart. It's actually super cool that this is just something he can do. It's not a power he got from doing the ritual earlier. That's just good villain design, especially in D&D, when the alternative would be to give him a bunch of spells. Mola tries to grab the stones, but Joan starts chanting in Hindi and repeating, You betrayed Shiva. Then the stones burst into flames, and two of them fall into the river. The third lands in Molaram's hand and burns him, and he falls. Indy catches the stone, but he's fine. He's completely cool. Probably because he didn't betray Shiva. Again, if this was not a real-world religion that mattered to a lot of people, my feelings around the scene would be a lot less complicated. Anyway, the Maharaja returns with his palace guard and the British soldiers, who heroically save the day by capturing or killing the remaining cultists. Which... Um... Yikes, the messaging on that is not great in so many ways. But again, strip away the context, and this is an okay decision for the adventure. It's a little jarring, mainly because we're not used to seeing it. In fairness, this actually used to be how James Bond movies ended. An army of good guys would come in at the last minute to help save the day. But in this case, it's also a nice reward to the players for rescuing the Maharaja. Of course, he could just go back to the palace and get help. That option was always available to the players if they'd thought to go back up and recruit the British to their side. Ugh, that sentence does not feel good to say. Indiana Jones pulls himself up the ladder with the sacred stone, and they return to the village. Immediately, we see that the crops have returned, and the people are happy and healthy. And obviously, this would have been nice to see happen. So maybe as the players are walking away from the bridge, flowers bloom around them. And that would help remind them... Oh yeah, people were starving. And then when they do put the stone back in the village, the moment that it's back in its shrine, they could actually see all of the crops renew around them. But of course, that would have been prohibitively difficult to pull off in a movie in 1984, so they didn't do that. The children return to the village, and there are many tearful reunions. The film implies that Indiana Jones learned something about magic and belief, which is kind of half-assed and doesn't really make sense, and especially doesn't make sense because this is a prequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark, where he doesn't believe in magic. But anyway, doesn't really matter. Then we end with Willie and Indiana Jones being... Romantic? I think this is meant to be romantic? Also, if anything in this video seemed like a positive review of Temple of Doom, just imagine Willie Scott doing this for two hours. The biggest trouble with her is the noise. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that was all from the same scene. Also, imagine going from Marion Ravenwood to Willie Scott. 
what a downgrade. Thank you so much for watching. Videos like this one are a lot of fun, but they do take a lot of time and energy. I had to completely re-record this video when I could not get the voiceover only version through the YouTube copyright system, which means I had to film and edit this entire video twice. So if you want to support me, I would really appreciate it, and there are a few ways you can do that. You can subscribe and ring the bell. That helps you see the new videos as soon as they come out, which makes them more likely to get recommended to more people, which helps the channel grow. You can support me financially on Patreon. At higher tiers, you can even suggest video topics. Based on a conversation we had, one of my $50 patrons wants to see a video where I talk about the lessons we can learn from film noir, so I'm currently doing some research for that video. That one should be a lot of fun. If you can't support me financially, that's okay. You can still join my Discord server and be part of an awesome community. You can also sign up for my newsletter and follow me on Twitch. Like I said at the top of the video, we're going to watch these movies on Twitch next week. You can pull up your own copy on Blu-ray or on Disney Plus or Paramount Plus and watch along with me. On Monday, June 26th, we're watching the best Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. On Tuesday, June 27th, we're watching this movie, Temple of Doom. On Wednesday, June 28th, we're watching my favorite Indiana Jones movie, The Last Crusade. And on Thursday, June 29th, we're watching most people's least favorite, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And then Friday night, or sometime on Saturday, I'll go see the new movie, and I'll probably do a live stream Sunday night to share my thoughts. Click here to watch a video about stealing from pop culture for your D&D games, and click here for a video about racism in D&D. Until next time, play fair, and have fun.